morning, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Voices for Tibet. This is a new video series by the Tibetan Children's Education Foundation. We are trying to capture the voices of people who support Tibet, support Tibetan culture, support Tibetan children's education. This morning, I'm really pleased that I have another old Tibet friend, another friend of TCF, Roberta Anderson. Welcome, Roberta. Thank you for doing this. Thank you, Karma. Thank you for organizing this wonderful series. It's a pleasure and an honor to be interviewed. And, and you know, I want to thank you as I thank all other guests because we are going through a period where we need every voice that we can for Tibet, for Tibetan causes. So, Roberta, thank you again. And I want to begin this by requesting you to introduce yourself to our audience. Great. Well, I'm a Montana native. I grew up in Livingston and Missoula, where I went to uh, high school and college. And then I left Montana in 1964 to, uh, after college to go to grad school in Seattle. And I didn't return for 39 years. I was living in several places in the, in the States and traveling all over uh, in Europe. I started in Europe, then I discovered Asia and was fascinated with India and Nepal and finally returned to Montana in 2003. And shortly after that, I, I became a board member of uh, TCF. Right, right, right. And so that's the part I picked up is this, that you are a traveler. It's so interesting. Folks around TCF, like Auntie VJ, yourself, you're all such international travelers. And so when you travel, Somehow in your travels, I'm assuming you connected, you met Tibetans. Uh, Roberta, tell me, how did you first come across um, contact with the Tibetans? I think it was first in Nepal. Uh, I saw some Tibetan ritual ornaments like bells and dorjes and purbas in a window a shop. Uh, and uh, in the shop of a window and uh, in the window of a shop, sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> And I was just uh, immediately so intrigued and fascinated. I just sensed something profoundly deep and sacred. I didn't even know what it was. Right. But uh, then I, I was in Kathmandu and I, I picked up a, a copy of the, the Dalai Lama's book, uh, my, my Land, My People. And I read mm -hmm. uh, Trungpa's book, uh, Escape from Tibet or uh, Born, Born in Tibet. And I just, something in me clicked. I don't even know if it was a past life memory or, but I just resonated so deeply. And uh, I'd, um, I'd had a uh, silver jewelry business okay. based, based in Jaipur. And uh, since my first trip to India in 1983, and uh, gosh, uh, then I started uh, buying and uh, collecting t Tibetan tonkas. Oh, I, uh, as as a little side business, and uh, I met more and more Tibetan people, and I was so impressed with how uh, just how honest and kind, and uh, they were wonderful to work with. Uh, I don't know; I was just drawn more deeply into the Tibetan culture. Right, like that, and I know that you made a deep connection because you've been a TCF sponsor and board member for I think close to about 20 years. And I know that um, last, not last week, but a few days ago, I was interviewing another inspirational TCF sponsor in Crystal Water. I also know that you have sponsored children, you have sponsored elders. Um, tell me a little bit about the persons that you helped in your life. Gosh, uh, well, let's back up a little bit. I first encountered, um, uh, I met Kitzel. I went to Kitzeling. Uh, okay. Uh, with I was I, I met VJ Supra, and we start we started traveling together in India. And at the end of our first trip, she wanted to uh, take me up to Kitzeling. Okay. And I I was so impressed with, uh, gosh, how kind the older kids were with the younger children, and the teachers were so sweet and. It was to me a beautiful example of how people can live uh, harmoniously together. Right. Uh, 
I just went, wow, this is a great place. And then uh, VJ invited me to be on the board. And uh, so I came back to um, Montana and uh, I didn't hardly know anybody uh, since I'd been away for so long. And suddenly I had this wonderful new group of friends uh, as kind of like an extended family. So, and I've been a board member ever since, but I, uh, I sponsored three children and, uh, and an elder. Right. And it's been one of the most rewarding experiences, I think, of my whole life. It's uh, oh. really uh, a great thing to do. I encourage anybody who's listening to this to, uh, to sponsor a, a child or a, or a Tibetan elder. Uh, it's just uh, an amazing way to have this connection with another person in a faraway land. Yes. Um, and Robert, I'm so happy to hear you say that because I remember one of your sponsored children was a young boy called Karma Jurme. Yes. Uh, last, you know, my previous interview with Crystal Water, I know her sponsored children became inspirational. You know, he says a success story. With your child though, I don't remember whether Karma completed school, went to college. And the point I wanted to make today was this, that when people help and you sponsor a child, not all of the children are growing up to become success story. But whether you help them for two years or five years, whatever education you help them, I always believe that it will stand them in good stead. And now I know that aside from sponsoring our children, you have also touched the life of a Tibetan elder. You have Mr. Sonam Tashi in your life nowadays. Yes, which is wonderful. It's just like having a contemporary since I'm an elder myself. <laughs> that is right. And then, Roberta, I also know you talked about Clementown. Have you been to Dharamsala? Yes, I went to uh, Dharamsala on a trip with v Valerie Hellerman. Right. Uh, and how is that community? I'm trying to look, aside from Clementown, what are other Tibetan communities? Like the one at Dharamsala, what, what was the vibe like? What was the takeaway from Dharamsala? Gosh, uh, my first trip to Dharamsala was before the trip with Valerie. And... Uh, I was just wandering around by myself exploring and uh, suddenly everyone was rushing over to the side of the road and I walked over there and I looked up and right in front of me was the, His Holiness the Dalai Lama. It actually happened wow, I, 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 I put out my hand and we shook hands, but it was such good fortune to meet oh this my God. beautiful example of a great human being. Um, oh and then, um, gosh, then with Valerie, we explored everything. We went to, um, well, I remember I was just, had gotten involved with the Garden of 1000 Buddhas here in Montana. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, we were just starting the gift shop. And uh, I remember the, the gift shop at Norbolinka, the summer palace. Right, and right. It was like, I went, wow this place has a sacred vibe. It's incredible that uh, a commercial place could have. So I went home and uh, told everybody, okay, I got the vision guys. This is what we have to do. And yeah. we, were, we were creating our gift shop from this ramshackle uh, animal barn. Um, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but with the help of uh, Sering Mangmo, a lovely Tibetan nun who was staying at the garden. And uh, we put together a, a beautiful gift shop. It was, I think it's actually realized my vision. So it's it's all just been an amazing whirlwind of wonders. Right, and that, I'm glad you brought up Evam because I was, in my line of question, Evam was the next thing I was going to ask you about. I know this, that we are just so fortunate to have someone like Turku Sangha Rinpoche build that beautiful garden of 1000 Buddhas at Arli, Montana. I know you are associated with it. You volunteer for it through the gift job. But Roberta, for someone listening in who has never heard of Evam or that beautiful garden, tell us a little bit about that. The garden is just an incredible blessing for all of us here. It's uh, an international peace garden for people of all love, uh, all faiths just to come and just stepping on the property, you feel different. It's like, wow. It's it is it, genuinely peaceful. It's it's healing. Um, 
I'm not volunteering at the gift shop this year because of COVID, but in the past years, people would come and they go, wow, what is this place? Nobody ever told me about this. This is amazing. But people from all over the, the, the country and the world have discovered it. Tilkosanak wanted it to be like the Bodh Gaya of the West, and it truly wow. is yes. uh, just a wonderful blessing for all of us. Yes, uh, that's, that's so right, because um, I remember having the privilege to translate for Rinpoche when the garden was first being made. And he wanted, his hope, his best hope was this, that when people come there to the garden, they could in some way leave behind their worries, their stress and the, you know, whatever tension people were having in their life. And it would be a special place for them to clear their mind, have peace of mind. In some way, it, the garden of thousand good Buddhas epitomizes all that is good and wonderful in our spiritual heritage. And I'm so happy that we have that right here in Montana. Oh, it's just a truly amazing. You know how it started from a vision that Tokusanak had when he was a small child. Tell us you a little bit about it. Let's spend a little bit time. In. So what, what did Rupichi say? Uh, he had this vision of, a, of an international peace center when he hmm. was a small boy. And, and then he was um, put in prison by the Chinese communists and uh, uh, just suffered well, he was being tortured and it was un very unpleasant, but he had the good fortune of being in a cell with uh, a bunch of uh, old Tibetan lamas. That's and right. they taught him how to meditate. And uh, yes. then uh, he said that when he left, um, it didn't matter if he never got out of prison because he had such peace of mind. Really? And, and he felt nothing but... Uh, forgiveness for these guards who'd been torturing them and compassion because he knew how they would have to suffer for uh, what their, their own ignorance. And then he went uh, and became the attendant for Dilgo Kense Rinpoche, the great Tibetan master right. who eventually sent him to America to teach. Right. And, uh, I remember when you said that, I remember Rinpoche, um, you know, um, talking about it and it's the same thing. He was telling me how uh, he was just so fortunate that even in prison, he had this almost spiritual learning, this spiritual experience. So Roberto, tell me, uh, for folks, uh, let's say that someone listening to our interview, they're hearing about Evam, and if they want to help support, if they want to um, somehow contribute to the success of the Garden of Thousand Buddhas, how does one do that? Uh, What's you an easy way to volunteer or to give? You can visit uh, the garden. It's just north of Arlie, Montana, and make a, a donation. Or you can contact uh, awam, e w a m dot org. Okay. And um, of course, uh, they appreciate a donation. There's also a Facebook page for the Garden of One Thousand Buddhas. Okay, I'll try and put a link up when we edit it, so that people have information about this wonderful place. That would be great, Karma. Okay, and then going back to our little nonprofit, the Tibetan Children's Education Foundation. Um, Roberta, I wanted to um, also pick your brain and say that going forward, I, I truly be, believe we have done wonderful work. Uh, we just celebrated our 25th anniversary last year. Going forward, what is your best hope for TCF? What more do you want TCF to accomplish for all Tibetans? I think getting more, more, more and more sponsors is, would help a lot. Do you agree? Okay. That's for children's education as well as for the elders, right? Yes, yes, absolutely. Yes. And then back to our main theme of Voices for Tibet. In your opinion, Roberta, if there is a person with a good heart or empathy for the Tibetan cause wanting to help, what would you say are some good ways to help Tibet and Tibetans at this point of time in their history? Gosh, well, there's a ICT, a national organization right. that supports Tibetans. Uh, gosh, everyone needs money. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> True. Um, I think just visiting the garden, familiarizing yourself with uh, 
the sacred culture of Tibet and uh, and I hadn't in, in, encountered Tibetan Buddhism until I moved back to Montana and Tukla Sanak's now my teacher. Right. And it's definitely enriched my life hugely. I just... Oh, uh, wonderful. So Robert, like in terms of um, like the spiritual heritage and how Tibetan culture ended your life, um, can you share... I guess this is a difficult question, but can you share one or two spiritual aspects, one or two facets of the Tibetan spiritual heritage that has touched you at a really personal level? I think um, it's that Tibetan Buddhism really emphasizes wisdom and compassion, both come together um, and are something our our poor suffering culture <laughs> is so desperately needs right now is care for each each other as a human family coming together um yeah just to, to care for each other it's so yeah. important yeah and that is so profound getting yeah. this sense of altruism you know not thinking about yourself only but trying to think about others welfare that i know is fundamental to our culture. And so, Roberta, thank you today for being this wonderful voice for Tibet. Um, you mentioned the ICT, that is the International Campaign for Tibet. For people wanting to support Tibet and Tibetans at a political level, I truly believe that is a wonderful organization. I think their website is savetibet.org, so please do visit it. And if anyone is interested in the work of the Tibetan Children's Education Foundation, our website is tibetchild.org. And for anyone listening in, wanting to contribute or a voice, be a voice for Tibet, um, I again take this platform to welcome all TCF sponsors and supporters to just reach out to me. I am actively looking for fresh voices for Tibet. Roberta, thank you for being this inspirational voice for Tibet today. My pleasure. Thank you, Karma. Thank you, Roberta. And I'll see you soon. All right. Bye.